You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. the people that is responsible for me actually being here, talking to everyone as I do, someone that brought me onto their platform and gave me a voice when I had just a very little voice in the world prior, and that someone is Randy Moggins of Off Planet Media, and so I'm going to bring Randy on. Hello, Randy. How are you? Your voice has never been small, sweetheart. Oh. Never. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> it was large even when it was sitting in the background pulsing. <laughs> well, you are definitely a major part of what rose me up into this level of the sphere where people listen and uh, lend an ear for an hour or two here and there. You are one of the people responsible for that. Well, thank you. Um, I'm blushing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a damn so it's truth. Good to, be, good to be back on the salon. Yes. Well, it's been too long, as we were just saying, and I didn't putter around. I wasn't having too much of a pre-talk because everything we talk about is so good. But it has been four months, and I'm just so shocked by it that how does four months go so fast, and how does so much happen within such a short period of time in our personal lives and now, of course, in our collective lives. The world mm, is a yeah. different place than it was when we last spoke. Well, this is the time dilation effect that um, as we move through this this concourse we're in, time does weird things. So like, you know, the actual flip-flop of calendar pages doesn't matter because we're rapidly accelerating through what temporal space once was is very different now it's a different it's a different space and time completely yes it is and i think that for those of us that are actually tracking this uh tracking the small things that end up being very large in the end the little tiny time slips, the little mm. personal Mandela effects, the little bleed over, we can see that that there is something changing in a very big way. The whole place is spinning in a different direction now, metaphorically. Mm. Metaphorically and literally, it's <laughs> spinning wildly. And, and believe me, even those out there who don't have the language to put all this together – I think are very aware of it. There's a perplexity with people that I, I see in day-to-day -day life that it's obvious this, this, this pull of this force that we're moving through, is, is, it's both wearing on them and it's changing them and it's changing the environment that we're in. It's a fascinating process. It's brutal. But at the same time, not all that is brutal is necessarily bad. It is, it's, it's a spin cycle. It's, it's like that. It's how you wring your clothes out. Well, it's the gigantic spin cycle of planet Earth now. Yes. <laughs> I was laughing at, internally at that image <laughs> because it really does paint an image. And it, it feels like that at the same time. And I think it's because everything is in flux well, a spin cycle, it's rocky, it feels rough, it mm. feels dangerous, it feels sometimes like we don't know what's going on, like we don't know when it's going to stop and what it's going to look like when it stops. 
Well, the incredible thing is that to the suit, you're going to pay a, you're going to begin to pay attention to these things because they are these little dots on the map. And every once in a while, as we sort of gain better facility with our internal systems, we have the ability to slow it down, speed it up, and modulate it. Um, ultimately, we're generating time-space fields as a result of consciousness. And so the internal process is, is one now where the better you are at understanding and monitoring your own inner states, the more control you have over the effects of this thing. And that's a huge part of it. And that's the part where you step over into the spiritual side. People who have spiritual disciplines, people who are anchored into their own harmonic, begin to get a facility for this. And it's, and it's almost like a flight, flight simulator. It's like that Microsoft flight simulator pro program. We're learning how to navigate something that humans previously haven't done for probably several hundred thousand years. And that's begin to manage consciousness on the level of our interface with the external reality. So it's, it's a fascinating process. It is. And of course, my curiosity keeps me in the game. I want to see mm -hmm. how it plays out. I want to see what's going on. I really want to be part of the process if it's just observation and of course that's my comfort zone then be it that but observation is interaction yes because we're we're in a quantum field so by observing you're also consciously altering that fabric which is again goes back to this inner navigator system and how we use the interface in new ways actually machines are showing us a lot about how this all works. It's kind of a reverse metaphor that the human has learned from the machine what the human is by having a structure to understand it. So you random access memory, solid state storage, capacitors, transistors, crystal oscillators, all of these things are metaphors for us to be able to manage the, the what's it's a big word, ontological sweep of the whole thing, the, the map, the big picture of how to begin to navigate this. Well, and that holds true in the psychological field too. We have to mm. pro project Inside. outward, right, to see what's inside. And yeah. sometimes that can go askew. We see that with different types of the psychosis and uh, mental snaps and breaks that are happening a lot right now to identify the processes. But I personally am very fond of projecting onto the computer analogies because we are in that space now because that is part of our Frankensteinian experience that is underway. We have created something that is artifice and it is, and I believe always has been, but where it is now, it is coming into its own. This, this makes us both observer and participant. And in doing that, to, to extend the metaphor, we are now able to begin to program the software platform. That's, that's really what this is about. We're all programmers on the level of human experience and interacting with this, mm, this, this, this I, the word matrix is so cliched at this point. I know. The fabric of this reality, I like that. The fabric of this reality and, and engaging it at a level where we're like now super consciously aware that even though things go wrong and, and things go horribly wrong, I really anymore don't even trust people that haven't had a damn good nervous breakdown. Oh, yes. I think that's actually a requirement <laughs> for surviving this whole thing. Yes. You know, it's funny you say that. I'm just in the middle of wrapping up a chat that's just going to be a private behind the curtain chat as I do. And the whole thing is really based on depression and then an NDE. And we are talking about that in there that – that you have to, you don't understand, you don't get it until you 
get it and you get it by going through it, by being a part of it. And if you have not struggled, then you don't appreciate it. It's like getting free money. You don't appreciate the free money until you work for it and you realize how hard it is to get to save up to get that something that you want rather than it just being given to you. And that I think is part of why we're here, part of this whole experiential ride we're on in the realm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the psychological and emotional component of all this is is everything. It's what separates us from many species and all machines, is that the one thing that can't be replicated is this unique component of the human psyche where the emotional scale is so wide open. People who have had encounters with uh, off-world beings have noted, and I note this as well, that they don't understand completely the human emotional spectrum. So, like, they understand aspects of it but it's on on another range with humans we have the ability to i mean we can blow out banks of computers with our brains because of the emotional force that we carry Mm -hmm. um it's it's the spectrum between what you would call love and hate is so profoundly deep and then the ability to process rapidly shifting realities and the reality about ourselves because The real, let's just say, fall apart moment is when you come face to face with yourself, naked and raw, in an emotional state, and you're literally almost peeling the wallpaper off the wall, trying to scratch at the surface of what this is. I've got so many metaphors in my head. (laughs) But But I mean, I've gone through this process a half dozen times in my life. It's a pretty predictable pattern, actually. At some point, you do face yourself, and the awesomeness of what that is is overwhelming. It's overpowering how powerful we really are in terms of just this this emotional construction of our temperaments, our our ability to feel things on a, on an intense level. You know, the the very thing that will make you fall in love can kill you. I mean, that's it's mm. it's all there. It's just like wide open. Yeah, man, that's a profound reality there. Let's look at this idea of what the experience is as far as the self in the experience. How alone are we in the process? Now we we already know, Randy, that we're connected through this, but I want to get myopic here for a while and talk about the personalized experience of moving through these dark times. And and truly, what we're moving through is a collective death, whether we want to admit that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that prepared any of us for this. I mean, I've said this a lot of times that I had the sense, even as probably as early as the age of 12, that we lived at this particular junction of time. I didn't know what to call it. And, you know, I sort of grew up with a biblical model of the apocalypse and all that that is, you know, all of the the poetic imagery that, that flows through that. But as we've gone down, I mean, you know, it's been a long, long ride for me, 50 years of, of waiting and thinking it's happening, it's happening, no wait, no stop, not now, not yet. And you keep going and, and you wonder, are we headed for some golden age or are we really headed for something horrific? It's actually both because you have to tear down an old construct before you can build a new one or you have to split that construct. There's a couple different ways this can work. I I view I view the world as splitting on one level and it's a violent process in that I think where we're at right now is we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of where this can all go, but it's not all determined. So like even like prophecy and foreshadowing and things like that, 
they can anticipate an event, but they can't predict it because uh, the interaction of, of human consciousness, both on a personal scale and a collective scale, are impacting this thing. It's like we were talking about, you know, the quantum aspect to this, the observational aspect. That simple act of observing something is an interaction in consciousness that's a very highly leveraged series of sequences that occur. My consciousness interacting, yours, billions of people. And the real danger isn't that we're all interacting with this. The real danger is that we're being interacted with by something outside of those consciousness bubbles. And that thing is is likely what we call AI, what we call um, some force, some external force. It's actually not external. It's internal to the planet now. But the external forces are there as well. There's nothing that prepositioned us other than the ability to be able to take a, a, a roller coaster ride that's like, you know, from hell and be able to go through it and enjoy the spins and at the same time be completely screaming at the top of your lungs as you go through this because it looks very different than anything you would have thought it would have looked like. You know, if nothing, the last two years have been instructional in that we have to learn to expect the unexpected because even though, let's just say the forces that are operating on us have been somewhat predictable, they seem to be able to pull little wrinkles out of the fabric of this thing and make it go in a way that you hadn't predicted. And I, I wouldn't have predicted that the world, probably for me the most compelling thing is in the last two years, the world feels like it's gotten colder. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's it's grown more divided. And it feels alien because people are walking around with masks on, people are guarded. People now believe that we're all biological weapons on two legs. That changes a lot of things from the emotional and psychological standpoint. And then you add in the heightened awareness of just, I mean, most people don't realize we're in a mass death wave right now because they're not reporting it, but mm. we are. Yes. And that reality will come to bear. And I, I, I just, I think I even posted this on Twitter a few days ago that I made some predictions about this based on remote viewing sessions that I did. And those predictions are that you will begin to see it. It will be palpable. People are starting to notice now that certain patterns of old have changed remarkably, whether it's the number of cars on the highway during work hours or the absence of children in a playground or the small details in life that reveal things that are not going to be told to you by um, the information gurus out there. So it's changed on a scale that emotionally we're dealing with a planet that's both in death rows and in birth cycle at the same time. It's, it's, it's weird. Yeah, it is definitely uncomfortable at times for sure. And one of the things for me is, and you know, I have often lived and often stay at the macro and really try to look at the broad strokes as much as possible. And then I come in for case by case stuff. I get myopic to understand parts of larger movements instead of the other way around. I think a lot of people are very walking on the ground and never looking up or, or staying very close in. However, one of the things I'm noticing, and this is happening naturally, this is something that really my autonomic system is moving me through. And so I'm paying attention to it. I'm observing it and I'm going through it. And I will admit to great bouts of discomfort and unease and uh, some stress here and there is that because the, of the fact that we've been primed for the last two years to basically 
whether we want to or not, kind of go inward with everything that's going on. And of course, that's easy for me. It's easy for us introverts out here. However, this is different. This is new, where I am now being confronted with things that are making me uncomfortable that also informs me that there is something bigger going on. If I'm feeling uncomfortable or uneasy, I know that something is in the field with me, that something with me may very well be myself detached from me, but it's in the field and I'm, I'm perceiving it. And so what I'm saying here is that this is starting to all feel very personal. And I don't think I'm the only person that is perceiving it this way, that to move this narrative along, I personally have to make some strides here that I think look a little bit scary. And of course, I have to move from that idea of scared. Now, I'm not in fear. It's just an unknown. It's something that's new. And I, uh, I'm i familiar with all the components of it. So I'm I'm facing it all head on. But at the same time, I'm acutely aware that I have to do the work here. There's a lot of aspects of there's fears that are known and there are the there's the there's the dread of the not knowing. Let's put it that way. That's probably the big hobgoblin right now is the dread of the unknowing of what lurks around the corner. And we are saturated with information, a lot of which is prefabricated for digestion. Um, most most of what's reported in media is there for us to consume, and it's laced with very strong undercurrents of fear, paranoia, division, polarity. And so there's that aspect. That's part of the whole colder world thing. And then there's what you said about what's in the field. And what's in the field at any given time is the X factor of this unnamed evil. What I've called in my my receiver series the apex predator. That's not an original name, but it's the only thing I can we can really call it. Is that there is something that sits in the field that is working to keep the levels increasing, the levels of paranoia, fear, suspicion, doubt. Because those all externalize, and so it's nemesis of the internal work where you are able to reconnect back in. So at any given time, we're being forced to go inside to deal with what we're processing from the outside. I think that's even where some of the isolation comes from, is that you find yourself in a place where you're almost like in fetal position in the corner, and... um, it's not flattering. It's it's not fun to look at as you're going through this process. You're kind of like, I sometimes get a loss for words anymore because what we're dealing with is the shadow of ourselves magnified. There is, if you look at current events and you can pick any of them, the mass shootings that have been going on, I mean, you know, the media wants you to think last weekend was the most deadly weekend in U.S. US history. Well, the media <laughs> handpicks statistics in order to weave a, a narrative at any given time. And right now their narrative is that basically Americans are just, you know, murderous warlords yeah, with each other. Ridiculous. And they want to keep us in that mode. This is about harvesting. I mean— The whole concept of loose harvesting, which, you know, again, it's another one of these cliches, but what can you say is it's true. It is archontic. It is the demiurge. It is whatever you want to call it, this supernatural presence in the field. It doesn't really have a form itself. It actually looks a lot like us collectively. And this is this is where you you either enmesh yourself deeper into the shadow or you begin to extricate from it as a result of understanding that there's a part of that 
that is you, that is me, that is, until we face that, we're, we're kind of squaring off with the unknown because it's collective, but it's also the shadow of ourselves magnified and what it's trying to show us in terms of how we move forward. Somewhere in there, I, I don't know anymore if I, if I answered your query or not. Well, it's hard to exactly answer that query because I find the nature of it being such a everything being so personal at this moment, at this juncture yeah. to get us through collectively. It is hard to find words for some of this. This is new territory and it is something that those of us that are observing definitely recognize is new territory. I want to take this where we are and look at this idea and it's out there in the field a lot now. It's been out there and you know this and we've both talked to people about this. We've both talked about it. But right now there is some gravity with it. And so the reset, and I'm not talking about the financial reset. I'm actually looking at bigger resets, bigger resets on the stage. So like the the wiping of the whole stage and then in comes the new cast kind of reset. Are you on what? On what level? All levels or? Well, like you- if we think about, if we think about, say, how some of the Tartaria people talk with, with how is it possible if we look back and we start deconstructing narrative that some of the stuff we're told does not stand up at all. And it may have in our lives, Randy, but where we are now with the state of technology, with the state of information exchange, with the state of a more collective awareness into the field and into narratives of the past, there is something that just sticks out. And that something that sticks out for me is I can't place in a logical space and time all the events that I was told happened. I can't look at old amazing structures and art and all of that and then look at the last 100 years, 150 years. I can't find anyone that has duplicated any of that. So I'm wondering how much... Is there really to be said about some of these larger resets? Yeah, well, reset, reset is, you know, and I was using the term reset probably starting back in about 2018 from the standpoint of that we were sort of edging that way collectively anyways, because we, I guess, do reset, but When you talk about history, you're talking about a narrative that was given to you because none of us have lived long enough to have more than a a factual accounting of history beyond 50 years of our life. You know, however old you are at this point, you are generationally linked to people who would have lived within the span of the last 50 years. Therefore, you would have contact with it. In my case... I'm able to touch back to actually the beginning of the 20th century through my grandparents when they were alive and the stories that they told. And there's a lot of weird things there. You know, there were a lot of orphans, for one thing. My, my maternal grandmother was one of them. And who knew that that was an important thing to have maybe asked more about when she was still alive. So... All we know right now really is the last hundred years documented and then really close up and personal the last 50 years. So everything that's been told and sold to us as time chronology is up for grabs because we don't actually know. I know there are people out there that have profuse document documentation, historical documents and things like that, but there's another aspect to this, and that's 
going into this time confluence. So this gets complicated real quick, and I'm trying to boil it down. Time is not what we think it is, and it is not linear. And we can have a narrative that looks linear because it has been constructed outside of time and inserted. This is what we call holographic inserts. And it's done on a macro level and a micro level. So certain major events that have occurred historically, even within our own lifetimes, have been insertions into our reality. And I, I cite 9-11 because I lived through it. Most people who are in our generation lived through it consciously and have memory of it. But what do you really remember about it? And when you go back and look at it and you feel that day when you probe it, I know what that day felt like. I remember it. There's two days that stand out in my mind that still bring the hairs on the back of my neck up. There's, 2000, there's 9-11, 2001. And there is the eclipse of um, 2017. Those, both of those events, in my perspective, had a color to them and a feeling of something profoundly different. In the case of 9-11, there are so many narratives about it and credible narratives because, and you think, well, because we don't remember, we misremember things. It's... It's kind of like the Mandela effect. Um, in some ways, it's selective, and in some ways, it's universal. If you try to prove it, you will drive yourself mad. And it's the same thing with history. We don't know what has been inserted. The second factor is the fact that we are interacting with time. We actually have the ability, because we project a time field, to move forward and backward in time, but the act of changing certain things in the future corrects things that happened in the past and vice versa. So the actual psychological time and the time frame relative to what you would call a linear, reali linear reality is subjective to you, the individual human, even if you didn't, didn't, don't think you lived in that time. Like I have conscious awareness of having lived sometime in the 1920s. I can feel it, I can sense it, I can taste it. That would have been the era of my grandparents, basically as adults, and what happened then. And the world was a very different place then. The world is a very different place than it was before September 11th, 2001, or before, I will say, December of 2019, the, the beginning of this current cycle that we're in. And psychologically, we're interacting with these events all the time on numerous levels. So when you talk about Tartaria, Tartaria is many things. You know, <clears throat> I've said this from the beginning because I looked at it. I do think it's compelling, and there are people that have fascinating things that they've brought up and, and uh, theories about it and thoughts about it, and they call out some very significant facts, but they're, they're always coming from the researcher base. They, they want something tangible. And my argument is that you don't really know how old these buildings are or are not. For all we know, they were 3D printed and dropped in you know, as part of a part of a reference frame for a holographic insert. So we don't know. Now that sounds like a prescription for madness on one level. But what it really is talking about is the feedback loop between consciousness and time fields and how we interpret history relative to a narrative that we're given. And I'm I'm sorry if that's really convoluted. Oh, not at all. It's actually beautifully said, and it takes us further into this. When we look at one of the things that happens for a lot of people when they transition out, let's say out of the time before now, because 
as you mentioned already, before we got into this space, and I keep calling it the time before, so time before 2019, uh, we could call that more of our normalcy bias of what the world had looked like for us for a long time, as convoluted as it got, as ridiculous as it got even then, and those of us that were looking beyond the veil could see, but here we are in a different place. And so this idea of losing one's memories, of Mm -hmm. things in the past slipping away from us. Now, this is within a person's life, and this can include even historians who've made their lives digging in lives outside of theirs and past times outside of theirs that held on to those concepts and their scholarship within that. And we were talking about that earlier, and that's a whole different set. That's a whole different uh, mentality of being. However, what I'm getting at here is there is something that's becoming very flimsy about the past, and this includes everyone's past. Now, if you lived before 2019 and you have a conscious memory of it, then you know that where we are now is way different, a whole different place than where we were then. And so one of the things I'm noticing, and this could be attributed to many things, certainly, but I just want to look at it as a concept, Randy. The idea that Is it possible that one of the ways in which people move on from a space, get off the ride, so so to speak, is they need to lay the burden down? And sometimes the burden is wrapped up in the stories, in the narratives, in the I, from the I that I am. And so... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, even in the time before, that as they got closer to that time, they have a sense of dementia, even if they didn't have Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or any of that, there was still a sense of they get close to their time and you're around them and they think you're their brother or their sister or their grandmother, you know, that everything starts slipping and morphing and becoming more lucid. And and I say lucid intentionally there because I think they're actually the ones that are actually encountering the fullness more than those of us that are in this space that we think is the real true, true. And so what I'm noticing now in mass, and this could be a case for the now year and a half later, prions disease that's spreading round. It takes about two years to start seeing that work. However, my point is, To lay the burden down is one of the ways in which it's easy to move on. And if we are not capable of doing it on our own, so this is a lot of work. It's a big responsibility on an individual to do this. Nature does it for us. Mama does it for us. God does Mm. it for us by Mm. allowing us that that where all of a sudden the memories of your life become very vague, very dusty. They always were, but they become dusty. So you're able to let go of the wife or let go of the husband because all of a sudden you're seeing them as your mother or your sister or your brother or someone else. And then whatever that magic is, whatever that magic moment is, it comes like a clean breath of air with no burden to it. And so what I'm seeing collectively with a lot of dementia around me, and Randy, I am noticing it. I'm noticing smart, very whip smart people. I mean, just this last week, stumbling for words, stumbling to hold up metaphors, stumbling, stumbling, stumbling. And by all accounts, nothing's wrong with them, but something's going on. And so when I was talking about getting personal and for myself, this is where it goes because we're, I'm, I'm niche, so I'm talking from my experience behind my eyes. How much of that is at play here? How much of the burden does one have to let go of now? And 
like I said earlier, with the autonomic system or the gift, the kiss from God to kind of help us with this by wiping our memories in a way, this seems like there's something going on bigger, like that's happening around whether we want it to or not. And the more I'm pushing Mm -hmm. into it, the more I'm noticing that's really what's going on. Yeah, you just, wow, how to unpack that. So we are in what my guides have called the great remembering. And the great remembering is also partially the great forgetting. How do you, okay, let's, let's stay with the term and be consistent. How do you reset a world? And I don't mean the world economic form and those evil bastards. How do humans restabilize while you clear the memory buffers? Yes. Because otherwise, we carry with us all of the psychological responses we have to change. And I will say this, somebody who's probably, I'm a Taurus, I'm really resistant to change. And in a lot of ways, I'm very fixed within my own my own width, I'm fixed in how I respond to things or how I think I would respond to things. When we suddenly change up the order, the closer we are to that place, we'll say, it's not lost on me that we have on polar ends of the life, the infant who comes in, Although I do not believe in tabula rasa, the blank slate mind, because I believe we are all imprinted with very unique qualities from the minute we, 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 we step out of the womb. Um, that on the other side of that, as you grow closer to the end of your time here, many people are going through this great forgetting as well, because it releases the pre-configured programs that you would respond by. All of a sudden, end of life is like beginning of life and that you you so the word the word that I'm gonna use here is the one that I was given when I was struggling with some things now probably about over the last two months. And that word was surrender. And you'll hear this in people that go through 12 step programs that um, there is a point where you you have to let go. You know, they like to say, let go, let God. Well, um, that depends on how you validate what you consider the external creative force. But I would say let go, surrender, because the ride will be easier. The, The message that I put out from the receivers last week talked about undertows and oppositional forces of curvature of waves and how a whirlpool will pull you into its vortex. And at that point, you have a choice. You can try and swim out of that, but that thing can probably pull you down, whereas your only choice is really to go as buoyant as possible, just to release your own internal energy and ride it out until it releases this, you get to a release point. And that release point is the point where you have an escape gravity and you can pull yourself out of it. But if you fight it, you're going to you're going to be so tired, you won't have the ability to swim out of it. People who have I've I've swum I've swam into these before in in river swimming because our rivers here have these. And, you know, you cannot fight your way out of it. There is a release point in that whirlpool cycle where you have the ability to to grab out of it, but you have to have enough strength left, which you don't have if you're fighting. And in a lot of ways right now, what we're dealing with, again, by metaphor, is this vortex that's going on. And the only thing we can do is really just ride it as much as possible, keep our heads above water, and wait for the spin to decelerate enough that we hit an escape velocity and and we can move out of it, which we can only do if we haven't exhausted ourselves attempting to fight our way through this. And that's the big difference right now. Most of what I see on a lot of, we'll say, um, alternative media is 
this fighting. We're going to fight for something. We're going to fight, you know, for whatever it is. And the point of the matter is that all you're doing is feeding the apex predator. You're feeding the archon by this energy, the excess energy that you're putting off, rather than the, the one that just goes, I know I'm okay because I've always been okay. I don't really lose my memories because they're all recorded in the cloud, you know, the Akash. And I just simply need to let go right now of the turbulence and let it do what it's going to do. And I'm okay with that. It's very difficult to do because we're wired to survival. And we're hardwired to survival, you know, through the limbic system. This, this fight and flight, that's, that's now how we're wired to respond. And this goes into a lot of what's going on around us in, in terms of world events. They're all tide pools attempting to pull us in emotionally, whatever it is, whether it's a war, whether it's a mass shooting event, whether it's, you know, whatever, the, the political economic tides they want to all pull us into their particular vortex. Whereas if we relax through this as much as possible, keep your head above water, there's an escape velocity at some point in that cycle. How do we discern that, though? How do we know when we encounter the doorway forward if we just keep our head above water and we stay loose and... Uh, going with the flow, so to speak, so that we have the strength to get through the door? Yeah, well, I think it's different for everyone. And I think that's... I will say that no one demises before their time. This is a really hard subject to talk about, and it's one... Sometimes find myself going, mm, don't say that. But everything I understand about this, having had a couple of near death experiences, is that you have no control, and yet you actually have a lot of control because what happens under crisis conditions, what just, just look at the psychological state of the world under crisis conditions. But under crisis conditions, your autonomic system is processing faster than time, real time. There's, there's probably 500 millisecond gap between the formulation of thought and the time that it's enacted into the conscious mind, which is an anticipation of time. These are proven. These are neurological studies that were done back in, in probably the 80s or the 90s. So we, we know this that we are already unconsciously working in a background process. So the conscious will, which is mobilizing the body, the emotional state and all of that is one stage of this. And then the other stage of this is the unconscious, which is processing information that's, that's giving you readouts on everything. How fast is the whirlpool spinning? Where's, what is the cycle rate? At which point does this thing break? How, how far do I tread water? When do I make my move? All of these things become unconscious because time is suddenly, normal time is suspended. A second becomes an hour. And we know this. Anybody that's had a trauma of any kind knows this. They know what happens to perception of time under trauma conditions. And why we survive or don't survive really isn't an issue of conscious will so much as what's going on in the background processes of the unconscious, which is, you know, obviously connected to the stream of consciousness of the higher self or over soul, however you view that. So to answer your question, the way we know is we know. We are in knowing. The more we rely on our own internal processing without responding to the external fear that's being pumped through an event, the more we're going to be able to respond to the inner clock, which is unerring, the unconscious, which will get you through things that you can't believe you survived. I mean, I've met a lot of people in my life. I'm one of them. I've survived things and I've looked back and I'm going, there's just no way. 
There's just no way. I mean, I had an automobile accident when I was a teenager. There's no way. You could have survived that. The cops told my parents that when they, when they came to the house. And they said, there's just no way anybody could have survived that accident. It was a head-on collision with a tractor trailer at 40 miles an hour. The car was decimated. How did I wind up on the side of the road? You know, those are things that we go out of conscious control. And this is where what we would call the unconscious and the oversoul take over. Yes. And I have had those experiences and many in our collective audience as well. Mm, absolutely. And so I think a lot of people really understand that because there's, there is something extra about it. You know, you're in some sort of hallowed ground, some sort of sacred space when those things are taking place and the world is, is different. And so let's apply this to a mass trauma event. So from 2020 to now, it's been in stages, it's been very methodic, it's, and we're still in it, it's getting ready to uh, drill down deeper. And so the collective is in the midst of a mass trauma event and I think collectively we are all experiencing the mystery of time within it and how things are kind of breaking down and coming together and just all this strangeness. We're in a strange space. Yeah, we're all going through that trauma cycle on a collective level. And the collective mind itself, again, it is part of, that that shadow reality as a culture as a world as a collective soul group very large soul group we're going through dark night of the soul these events happen in cycles of thousands and thousands of years so there's no pre-programmed response for this they simply happen um you know, you look at the collapse of civilizations and people ponder over, you know, the collapse of the, of the Greek empire, for instance. How could something, this, this powerful collapse, how could Rome have collapsed? And the answer is that there was a collapse in the collective psyche. And they went to something collectively together, which ended their civilization. That civilization... Demised slowly, but there was a collapse point. There was a definite point when a when civilization collapses. There is a definite point when a world collapses. And the, the collapse simply means that the system falls apart. And that system is now in free fall. Uh, the system doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work under conditions of consciousness relative to everything that's happened to us and I will just use the time frame here from 2017 forward to 2024, that period of time, because I believe we entered a temporal platform in August of 2017 when we had that massive eclipse that shifted us into another time frame dimension. And so everything became different at that moment, but it unfolded itself and it unfolded over a number of years to where we are now. The conditions for that to exist were wrapped in the consciousness that was brought forward from that. Our consciousness interacts with time. So everything that we're now experiencing wasn't possible in the old construct. So in one sense, there was a reset. How do we get our minds around this idea of and I and I'm looking at where we are now so not the time before so within this envelope or this platform of these great eclipses because they do take us into the next couple years to do the full cycle yeah. and those that are moving out of our sphere and many are um, how how do we perceive that 
in this time as opposed to the time before, because there's something a little bit different with those that are passing right now. There's something a little bit different in the process that I'm noticing of some people that are passing right now, as opposed to all my experiences with say death prior, there was something that was still more concrete in the past. And now there's something that feels more shadowy, more wispy, more almost smoky. Mm. That's an interesting way to put it. So, yeah, on one level, um, what's changed really is the shift in dimensions. So there is this space, this place that sits in dimensionally kind of next to us. Uh, it's the Old Testament Gaf, the, the river of souls. And I know that uh, Hebrew lore views that as kind of a pool. It, what it really is, is it's the place between worlds. It's part of that veil thing. And that veil thing thinned. The veil thin to the point where there's emergence that's occurring. And that space, because it is a space that it really is a, a conveyance of the departed, that space is clearing. That space is not really the, it's the dead energy, it's the death energy. So what's happening now is there's an affinity that's going on amongst the people as well suddenly the frequency of death is much closer to us because there's not that that delineation anymore that, if you think about it we're we're really in a time when we're merging certain dimensions that dimension merges into this one and in that respect it is also bringing with it the, the same energy. So people who are passing over now are acutely aware. They feel it. It's palpable. It's a, it's a death energy. It's a dead energy. And some have chosen to merge with it. Their passage from this world is no less honorable. And in fact, what my guides have shown me is that we will be saluted for having chosen this time at all to have lived in it and to have died in it, if that be the case. Because under these are conditions which haven't occurred on Earth before, these dimensional shifts, there's a, there's a new order. And it's working through a lot of energetics that are both off-world and on-world. The shift in consciousness makes everything heightened. There's greater contrast. And I mean, I've talked about this, I, I keep bringing it up just because it's my reference point was that in 2018, I was doing some internal processing and pulled an etheric imp implant, several of them actually, and then saw dead people just like six, the movie Sixth Sense for about two months and um, started to experience some of this death energy myself. And go even going into 2000, into 2020, in February that you're doing the snow full moon, I was having death dreams like crazy, which was part of this breaking down of the veil, was that this death energy was coming in and we were becoming very acutely aware of it. And the thing about it is there's a point, you know, and I kind of hit that point. I wound up in the hospital about six weeks later with a very big reality that, you know, dying is actually kind of easy now if that's the choice that we make for ourselves. But the reality of it was that it was, it was palpable. You could feel it. And, and so that's kind of all of, all of this shift that's going on is, is really the frequencies of death and dead, dead energy that are, it's an attraction. It's like, if you're attracted to that, you're attracted to that. And, you will interact with it. You either interact with it to discharge it or embrace it. What about the idea 
And this is something I think a lot of specifically Christians are thinking about, the risen and resurrection and coming back into the dream, the illusion, whatever life is. That, I think, has more energy fed into it now. Yeah, that's like fucking incredible. You know, actually, <laughs> actually, more and more I'm thinking, well, what if you just reemerge back into a reality, into another plane? You know, what is this whole death birth process? Yes. That, that's so, is that really required? Well, I actually think it's not that, you know, we simply have chosen to go through this process um, as this format of humanity. But in fact, there's nothing that prevents us from passing out of this world, forming a new body and dropping into a reality, whether it's this one or one that's, you know, somewhere else. And maybe this is part of that, that whole cycle of forgetting as well is that once we do that we cast off this shell we pick up the next shell and that shell then activates into another realm somewhere or back into some format some version of this one because there are multiple versions of realities at all given times that's the slippery part of about it is that you know if i tell you that you'll get well you're delusional but The reference points are that, you know, collectively we've agreed on a set of rules that make our reality construct function. But outside of that, really, there aren't that many reference points when you really look at it hard and fast. It goes back to the whole Tartaria thing. It's like, "Hmm, why, why didn't anybody ever ask about this before? Well, because they never saw it before. This is new. That's part of what I'm finding exciting in this, because this is new, there are new things to question. And because this is still the field, it's still attached, even and albeit very vaguely, to some things that seemed more concrete in the past. There's this whole new set of data that's coming in, or that it, I don't even think it's coming in that we're it's becoming aware of. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, the, it's a new data set, yes. and then the awareness of it. Because once we become aware of something, we magnify it. It's like <clears throat> we were out for a drive last weekend, and we happened to drive through a county north of here. It was actually the county I grew up in, and it's rural. And we went through the the town square of the county seat where the courthouse and everything is. And as we rounded it, I looked up at the courthouse building and I went, hmm, that's really interesting. What an interesting place to put a gold onion domed building in the middle of a rural <laughs> outback county that only had two red lights until about maybe 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, well, Wow. Didn't notice that before. Don't remember that before. Did I not remember it or did I not notice it? What's the same thing? Absolutely. You have to notice to remember. Or Mm -hmm. you have to have a trigger point to go back and find that it was there but you didn't have the context for it. I mean, it's where those laying the seeds out that I was talking about with my momo or the, you know, the, the sub narrative sometimes that we access as we're talking, you know, they had turned CERN back on. What, what do you think about that in terms of where we are now with our knowledge point of what that possibly means? Yeah, I saw that they turned CERN back on. Um, I'm not sure I know what that means at this point, whether they're actually running it or whether it's just up and operational. They no, shut they, it they down. Ran it. They ran it and they, they're doing they the colliding it. thing. They're doing the whole thing. Yeah, um, that will certainly contribute to a fair amount of quantum turbulence. That may be actually kind of a stem winder anyway for a lot of the high weirdness that's going on right now. 
is that that kind of has a ripple in space time as well. I don't know how big it is. I think a lot of people created interesting narratives around CERN that, you know, are hypothetical. I don't actually know that, that CERN was responsible completely for even what we call the Mandela effect. There was a lot of things in play. The fact that they've turned it on now means we're probably hitting another one of these um, event horizons where, th where, where things are on a pivot and they're turning it on because all they're trying, they, the ones that <clears throat> run the system or think they do, much like Project Looking Glass, all they want to be able to do is, is predict and control the reality construct. And they know that they've lost the ability at some level because they can't see. And they also know that you know, as good of a run up the flagpole as the whole Rona thing has been, they weren't really successful. They, they're really far behind schedule by their own reckoning right now. Like they reset the clock to 2030. They're going, well, look, you know, this... This, the 2012 didn't work out and um, 2020, you know, we, we sort of crossed the Rubicon again. But uh, this seems to me like they're, again, anticipating an event horizon that's coming and they're trying to get on top of it. Well, yes, I agree. And it is funny that we all focus in on CERN because there are other colliders Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we're told that's the biggest collider. And and my feeling on colliders, period, kind of ties into this whole Tartaria thing in a very strange way. So you strip a lot of the narrative around the Tartaria stuff, but if you just look at buildings as acoustic tools mm -hmm. and stuff like that, if we start looking at the architecture as tools and uh, honing tools and sound tools and frequency tools in that way, no matter what time period they're from. And like I said, stripped away from all of that. But if we just look at them as tools and we think about colliders, of course, as another set of tools. And then one of the things that had struck me along my journeys is that the SS in their manic hunt to find technology of all kinds across the field, across the realm, and to retrieve it. You know, they're very interested in a lot of different things, not just the sphere of destiny. It seemed to me, and this is, I don't hear, I keep standing alone in this ground, but am I right to? I actually think they discovered the colliders or at least a collider and back engineered from there. So that's where I stand with it. And I think that when we start looking at 1947 again and applying more data to what we call 1947, you know, we could give it a year and two, that whole period. It starts to change the narrative a little bit. There's a, a, a slant to it. There's a different cast of light to it. When we think about these latent tools, this tech that is in the field with us that we don't quite understand, and apparently something in the field understands it, I believe. And that something that understands it is coming into contact with us. Now, conceptually, this could be our creator. This could be God. This could be some sort of progenitor race. This could be a lot of different things. But I do think that there's something big like that going on, Randy. What do you think about that? Okay. You said something that really caught my attention, sound. The next level of knowledge for humanity is to discover sound on the level that it was used to build the very things that we consider to be wonders. Colliding materials is in a collider. This is, in my mind, it is part of the same 
destructive force energy that we've harvested off this world for you know several thousand years now epitomized by the use of what is you know petroleum crude black goo coming from the earth and we did that and we unleashed horrific things upon ourselves as a result of that and then obviously the manhattan project and all that came out of that and not just the atomic bomb, but there were sub-projects to the Manhattan Project that fed into this as well. There were much darker things going on there. But this is all part of the present mechanistic science consortium that has piloted the the fate of humanity for the last, well, since the last reset. Let's just put it that way. If you want to count the clock back, I don't know, 200 years, 150, 175 years. They've been in control of the narrative since then. But the more interesting thing are the subtle energies. And sound is it. Sound is the energy that we've overlooked because um, in sound you have electromagnetic waveforms and oscillations. And you have interesting ways to begin to use energy on a creative level. We have the model in front of us. If we just could think larger. We learned through Edison how to magnetically manage sound waves and produce things that we called recording sound as a means to transmit ideas, music, spoken word, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word is the format of creation, and it is sound, and it's primary. Obviously, sound and light are both, you know, parallel energies in that they both are different formats of the same thing. But sound on a whole level is visceral. It, it has the ability to move things. And colliding atoms, colliding fissionable materials, all of the mechanistic processes that we're still stuck in are missing the point of it, which was how do we, in a physical reality, go to the next level of creation, which would be obviously to recapture the ability to create these marvelous structures, edifices, artworks, these you know, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, these magnificent cathedrals that use flying buttress technology at a time when people barely knew simple math, much less calculus. And all of this unfolds into consciousness when consciousness begins to sow into the field the idea. But part of the system is this this mechanistic science. And the mechanistic science we either move past this or it will destroy us. That's really the decision point. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the one of the burdens that is upon us, actually. Yeah. Collectively and personally. Yeah, well, we can begin this within our within our own selves within our own families, our own tribes, our own communities, by beginning to format the sound, the song, the song of songs, the song in the heart, and the heart resonance, and the amplification of that. See, these are all things that we think are just, you know, either... Peripheral or silly, most people. But, you know, anybody that, that's a musician understands how much sound can move you, you know, whatever it is, whether it's those, those marvelous synthesizers that you play with or, you know, this marvelous note on a bass guitar or a particular uh, drum rhythm. Those are fundamentals that we can build from. And those. Those fundamentals can be amplified in a way that we can learn to use sound direct to direct energy. 
we were designed to do this. We were designed to speak things into creation. Let's look at the field for a minute. Say we're in the field and there is no light, there is no sound. What is the field? That's not a field, that's a void. <laughs> Could that be the same as dark matter? It could. We need to use dark and light terms in order to obviously differentiate between perceptual levels of um, different forms of energy or force. It really light or dark, you know. We're, 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 we're fundamentally blind creatures even within our own spectrum. I mean, are the beasts around us see much better than we do. Most of them hear better than we do. They certainly hear better than I do anymore. <laughs> and on some levels, they understand it better. There's something, you sit and listen to the birds sing. And there's something powerful about that. There's something creative about it. There's a life force that's, it's a vibration. Listen to the, the sound of a beehive. Uh, that's creational sound. And so, you know, this is the part that we haven't accessed yet because, again, we're moving out of this, this mechanistic mindset and the vibrational frequencies that will amplify this are the, what's trying to come into our consciousness. It's being beamed to us. This is the whole solar flares, X flares, space weather. Well, you know, like Earth itself, the weather changes all the time. Do we have earth changes? Earth changes constantly. Yes. Of course we have changes. And of course we have space weather, but the space weather is the music of the spheres that's trying to communicate to us. If we look at the narratives that are swimming around, say, the outer hole of this conceptual black hole, you know, we're moving through it and somehow, and I'm just coming at old school hockey and type analogy here where it breathes. And so, but all this muckety muck is reached a her, event horizon. It's all around the outer lip of the black hole that will take it in and breathe it out and push it God knows where. Um, and where time and space bend and all that stuff that was brought to us. Now, whether any of that holds up in theory, outside of theory or not, so many people have debunked it. Some people are bringing it now back into the mix. It's all over the board. But I like it as a concept. I like it as an idea philosophically because it can take us somewhere, just like it is supposed to as an idea, it is a portal of some sort. So say this is the, the inward collapse of everything we've known and we're moving through it like the eye of the needle. Mm -hmm. And as we move through it, as it destroys everything we know, and if we get into the personal level as, as a person, as say I move through it, and everything I know, everything I've experienced, my life, everything I hold dear, everything that's made me up is getting ready to move through. It's all in pieces right now around the outside like space junk. And the core of me is already halfway through and I'm dissipating and my stories are dissipating and everything's fading away from me. And I'm afraid of, of where I'm going and what's, what I'm clinging on to, which I, I often find in the wee hours and the dark hours are very strange things that one clings on to. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just like things you just would, for me, I just am like, why do I have such an attachment to say that doll, you know, or something? It seems absolutely insignificant. But in this process, and we're collectively going through it, there does feel to me right now, and I did put this in the context of current times, that there's something really dark in the field. And we talked about this earlier with your terminology of the Atex Predator. Something feels dangerous here beyond the normal aspect of danger that keeps us lucid. Something else is here with us. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know if it's the the proverbial black hole itself, which could be the metaphor for death. But of course, we were looking at it in the Hawking way, the death that brings us into a new form and into another place, or if it's annihilation altogether. I don't know what it is, but Randy, something feels very dark here. And I think, you know, a lot of the Christians are talking about antichrist energy, whatever it is, something feels very indifferent towards us in the field right now. Yeah. um, Well, a lot of that is even formatted by, you know, if you're talking about Christian prophecy, for instance, that that's something you actually have to deconstruct because a lot of the overlay with Christian prophecy has had to do with interpretive components of taking a lot of different things and compounding them together to get at this, you know, it's almost like a comic book, you know, and the concept of the Antichrist and the Gospel of John. John says even now the Antichrist is here. It's always been here. Why would there not be? If there's a Christ, there's an Antichrist. It's balance. It's not something to fear. It's something to be observant of. But what is the eye in the eye of the needle that can see the eye that's going through the eye of the needle? See, this is where we wind up traveling through the dark hole and we wind up facing ourself. What happens when you do that? I mean, think about it for a minute. Have you ever met yourself? Have you ever met another you? What happens if we're going through emergence with multiple composite aspects that are coming together? Because there's a super soul, an over soul, and the over soul is now asserting itself into the fabric assertively. And the battle is that this predator, this, you know, demiurgic force senses all this. It knows it. And all it wants to do is keep harnessing energy. Whereas the antithesis of this will no longer feed it. When you no longer emit fear, when you never no longer emit lower vibrational impulses when humanity one by one by one by one comes to the place where they abandon the limbic response and go to the cerebral response and that kind of relaxing through the system and I don't mean relax like sit back light up a cigarette and have have another beer I mean allow composure to come into it. We will start becoming more engaged with the reality creation. That being will wither. Evil itself only survives because of the shadow aspect of who we are. We used to talk back in the old shows a lot about the accretion field, the the black cloud that sits above the earth, which is this aggregation of dark energies that we've emitted over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And nature has a memory. It's permeable. And that cloud is only maintained because we continue to put off that type of energy. Whereas once we move into the next level of humanity, we won't feed that energy anymore because we won't have that bandwidth. That will be can- that'll cancel it out. So by saying that, what I'm saying is when we begin in this process to go through this and realize that we are greater than the sum of our th- fears to kind of mangle a quote, the other side of that is the creational aspect of it, of being able to harness darkness and light and use those polarities for us instead of having them wielded against us as these engines of destruction. You said something there that actually gave me the chills. And it's in the way you said it, definitely, because it's not unfamiliar to me. In fact, it's very familiar, and I think that's why it gave me the chills. But it was the context in which you delivered it. And it was 
to when we move through the eye of the needle that we encounter ourselves. And this is a big deal. This is kind of at the heart for me of everything that does go on that is going on and how difficult it is. And it's, it's part of as an observer of the realm, one of those things I make note of all the people that you can see obviously hate themselves. Right. And so we, I mean, we can go from surface level all the way to soul deep. And so I can recognize in the world all the self-hatred people put on themselves and how they glum together like parasites without knowing it or being possessed Mm -hmm. by parasites Mm -hmm. to project that onto others. And we certainly see it in the plastic surgery realm and in the, in the entertainment. It's it's interwoven into our culture. Yes. You're totally right. This is, um, where did we learn this? Where did we get to a place where we hate ourselves? Where did we get to a place where if our body doesn't exhibit the proper proportions or, uh, you know, we aren't of a certain group of people or we're part of a group of another part of another group of people, whatever it is in the whole socioeconomic spectrum, the shaming thing. How did we come to hate ourselves when we were designed to to glorify our creator, however you view a creator, whether it's, you know, abstract or more concrete, you're a creature of beauty. Your, your forms are forms of magnificent proportion. And all of this is, is part of, part of the creative process. And this idea that we don't measure up, that we're not good enough, that, our life is shit, that our world sucks. This was all programmed into us because of this harvesting operation. It was how we were conquered. And we can never be conquered except we conquer ourselves. And that's exactly what they've done. As a body politic, they've split humanity. They've split everything about us. They've split our consciousness. They divided our brain into two hemispheres. They, they split our personalities. They split our genders. They split everything about us into as tiny a pieces as possible, and then threw them on the floor and said, look at this ugly mess. How the hell did we get to that? That's, that's exactly... I'm really good. This, this actually is the, the core of everything that we've talked about. Yes. It's until we start to love ourselves, until we can really... And trust me, I, I'm saying this as somebody who's not there. I mean, I, I struggled, and I understand on the spectrum... Of all the people who are going to hear this, we've all been in that place. Yes. And we know what dark place that is. And I know it real well. And this is not of our making. This is the making of another consciousness, the dark consciousness that came into this world long, long ago. And it enmeshed itself into the energetic grid of the earth and it's amplified these energies, and it's played. It's played by, you know, off-world and on-world players. All of it's been played because they went, wow, look at that. That's pretty amazing. Look what, look what humans will do. They'll kill each other. Mm-hmm. They'll kill themselves. Mm-hmm. They'll denigrate themselves for their race, for their sexuality, for their economic structure, for whatever reason. Look They'll cannibalize. That. They will eat themselves. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's as dark as you can imagine. Yeah. And the only cure for this is when we go through the eye of the needle and we meet ourselves. And you can look at yourself and go, you know what? You're beautiful. You deserve to live. You have something to offer in all of humanity that's completely unique from every other being that has ever been created in all the universes of universes. This is the part where humanity has real low self-esteem problems. Yes, and and that's what is making everything so grotesque. This is mm-hmm. where the ghoulishness is coming from. It's springing directly from this parasite that seems to be really infecting the whole. Yep. 
sometimes I don't know what else I can add to that. I was almost, I got really emotional saying that because it's probably the most difficult threshold we have to cross individually and collectively. We have to go there individually. All of us have to go through this. This is part of why we incarnated. There are worlds that are far more frictionless than this. A lot of this gets overplayed, this concept of, well, we lose soul contracts and things like that. Some of that's kind of new age babble. I mean, there are soul agreements to some level, but none of it's fait accompli. Um, we came here to, to play a game, mm -hmm. and we got inside of a game where the rules change all the time. So we're constantly upended. We're, we're not balanced. But we make decisions. And I will say that it's really difficult sometimes to look at things, especially when it involves children, mm -hmm. and make sense of it. And the only way you make sense of it is that sometimes things just go wrong. And the reason things go wrong is because of this echo of self-loathing that humanity has. So you take, like any one of these mass shooters, I'm not going to go on a rampage over this, but, you know, it's what's been on radar, obviously. But if you look at them, aside from the fact that I will say that MK Ultra has now morphed to a place where psychotronics is their weapon of choice, so they can, yes. through the internet, harvest you know, whatever they want without having to spend years and years of doing mind control anymore. Yes. So having said that, these are now highly targeted, designed jobs being done for specific reasons. And at the same time, they feed in again to this arcanic harvesting program. You know, so it's all good for them. It's all profit because there's, there's profit from this. And it's cynical. You know, the thing, all of this we have to understand is <clears throat> there is an order. And children come here. We have guardianship over them. We have guardianship over them as parents and as a society. We have failed as a human race to properly care for children on a collective level, including putting them in fishbowls like where they can be shot at. Yes. And so, you know, things go wrong because things are wrong. This is, you know, the pulse of humanity. And all these actors that are on the stage are being triggered because they themselves are self-destructive, self-loathing, and don't realize the inherent beauty and deity of their own selves. So, of course, they're easily used. If there are people that have gone through programs who were able to resist or came out of the programs and were able to break away from the programming. And that's only because they had within them a reserve of what we've been talking about, the ability to view themselves as something worthy despite everything that they've been told, including the suicide programs that are programmed. So... You know, humanity's problem is we don't love ourselves and we don't consequently love each other. And the lie that's been told is that you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you can't make it because the world is seriously screwed. When we have to come around to the other side, we have to face ourself, embrace ourself, and then we can begin to emanate this, this vibration, this frequency. This is not something you're going to do in five or ten years, I don't think. I think this is a very long-term project, but I think it's ramped up now, and I think we can either see the, the fruition of this or we will see the culmination of what evil, what darkness wants to do, and this is the war that we're in. What about the idea that we knew this beforehand and now it's at play it's in action and conceivably it always has been but that's another rabbit hole 5g had to happen it needed human hands to 
make it happen. And so whatever else we want to talk about it, it is a platform for augmented reality and holographic insets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just did a grand uh, introduction to the idea of holograms in the larger world, aside from, say, rock stars, dead rock stars touring. Uh, You know, they gave the, the queen in her covenant of the ark. If you look at it, that's clearly what they are showing with the angels on either side. That that coach is the covenant of the ark. It is it is not that, but at the same time, it is a facsimile of that. And within it, we saw the hologram of the queen. Now, we are in the realm of augmented reality. We are in the time of of all this stuff now that is real but not real that's digital but not organic and if you can't actually discern what's real how do we navigate the territory well this is just the consumer version of technology they already had anyway i agree but it's in the field now I mean, it's in the field as far as public now. They've had it, but they've trickled it down now to the point where you know it's happening because you can play in meta, because you can do these games. So we're we're beyond the point where you and I have been in the past talking about where people are calling us conspiracists. Now it's in the field and everybody knows it's in the field. Right. This is, you know, this is the convergence. This is really what... I guess they were talking about the singularity. It's what, you know, Shane's talked about in terms of the machine. There's a lot of different ways to depict this, but it's not an accident. They simply, it's a distributed way of bringing about a totality because you have Meta, which is obviously being shepherded in under Zuckerberg and Facebook. But then again, you have... The other side of this, which is SpaceX, Tesla, Elon Musk, these satellites that they're putting up, which are 5G satellites, and hundreds of them. I mean, they've even deployed some over um, Ukraine uh, for purposes of, you know, I guess, keeping that going. And at the same time, you have Musk bidding to get a hold of Twitter. And complaining about all the bots on Twitter, which is like, what, really? I mean, (laughs) who knew that it was infested with bots? The whole Internet's infested with bots. And so the Queen's a hologram and Mm -hmm. um, Abba's on tour. And Mm -hmm. uh, these are all, you know, just little little pieces of something that they're they're trying to put together, because what they want you to do is Apple's going to eventually unveil their their augmented reality system, which <clears throat> probably going to be a lot better than anything that's out there right now, because the longer Apple holds off on something, the more dangerous they are in terms of the deployment of technology. Yes. <clears throat> so they want you to get to the place where you basically cocoon yourself into a virtual augmented reality in place of the f- present physical reality. You basically become cocoon people and consciousness then gets contained. And that really is the simulacrum at that point. See, we're still in free play right now. You can choose or not choose. You can be in the simulacrum, but you still have the ability to move out of it because, you know, the consciousness waves have come in and we've always had the inherent ability to, to move out of this, but it is a trap. It's, it's, it's really where human humanity would be harvested. It would be, you know, the biblical harvest, so to speak. And it would be the place where you just go into a soul death, where your, your consciousness collapses and disconnects from the external support pod, which is, you know, higher self and, and the chain, the hierarchy of beings which exist around you in your, in your personal orbit on the ancestral chains and aspect selves and uh, you know the memories and beings that you both were and will be 
they all get funneled into this and then you know it's it's an enclosure it's a terminus and that's what they want to do with this and the question is will humanity wander in and take the cheese or will we be wise enough to look at this and go no you know what i went through that funnel and i met myself at the other end and um, as hard as it is, this reality is still better than anything you can simulate. And so some of this, if we get down into the details where the devil is <laughs> and look at some tools that are here, but the thing is the tools have to be older tools, not all the new tools, not all the new stuff, just like they took away lead paint and copper mesh and windows and all that stuff that somehow in the end makes a a shelter a safe place from dangerous microwave energy, radiation, all that stuff that somehow the past seemed to know and apply. And so with the new houses, they are stripped of that. In fact, they are completely wired up to be digital AR or VR containment fields. That's what all the new stuff is about, including the new clothing, everything. So if we look at some of the old stuff, the stuff I love that has patina, the stuff that might fall into the idea of another world before this world, but you can still find this stuff in antique stores. So yeah. let's look at silver. Let's look at silver. And let's tie silver into some narratives of the past. So, for example, vampires. And let's strip away the idea of what people think vampires are in modern terms as parasites and bloodsuckers and um, sexual predators. Because that's in the end, not what they are. And in in fact, the term vampire is a coin term. So one of the things about a vampire is you can't see its reflection in a mirror. Well, if we throw Which this... Is silver. A real mirror is silver. Right. But a modern mirror is not. Do you see where I'm going? And so most people don't have old mirrors. Most people don't have silvered mirrors. Now my house is riddled with them because I only like old things. And I like yeah, this. I've old- got one right behind me. <laughs> no, you can't see it because I'm not on camera, but it's an oval and it's a portal. Yeah, absolutely. I, They're powerful. I, aren't they, Randy? I went and bought it at an antique store. I just spent months looking for just the right mirror. They, it, we must have them. And if you're out there, you you should try and get your hands on one. So the, the point I'm getting at is that if we deconstruct some of the tales and some of the stuff that's been, let's say, demonized to keep us away from some of these tools, there's some stuff going around about silvered mirrors right now. Now, this isn't new. This is not new to me, and this is not new to a lot of people, but it it is new at the same time to a lot of people. Through old tech, you can spot what is not real. Through a real silvered, silvered mirror, you can see what's really with you in the room. You can see yourself as you are. And therefore you, and you, it's also, it's the portal, it's the magical silver. There's a special element in silver that's not really discovered yet. And that'll come out in the future. I really believe this, Mm. but that's, that's just fodder for another day. So if we look at this idea of a silvered mirror showing us the realm as it really is, we have a heads up here. So say there's, people out there that are taking old compacts with silvered mirrors. Now you have to know what you're looking for in a silvered mirror there. You know, they stop making them. They stop using real silver. Like, oh, to twenties and thirties. There might still be some here and there, but they were really, it became expensive, right? It, it mm-hmm. was, it, they had new tech and all this. And, 
uh, new ways to silver things. But people are taking real silvered mirrors and they're finding out extraordinary things about the environment around them. So this is actually some woo going around right now, Randy, where people are in, it started out accidentally. Someone was looking in their mirror and they realized they saw these people behind them, but they didn't hear them. And they looked and they were holographic insets. They were there by mm-hmm. the visual eye. They are there in other silver reflected surfaces, but not in the silver mirror. Yeah, where to go with that? I mean, it all goes, you know, back to Lewis Carroll and <laughs> Alice and the it's looking glass. And tied into Project all, Alice all the way. Yeah, the, um, I mean, silver is a mysterious element on a lot of levels. Even just, it's a purifier. Mm -hmm. Oh, Um, yeah, absolutely. It's anti-parasitical. Exactly. (laughs) So, of course, we don't want a lot of that around because (laughs) really what we're dealing with on every level is parasitic. Mm -hmm. They really don't don't want people aware of that anymore. I mean, gosh, you know, Big Pharma can't synthesize that shit. So I'm not sure where you want to go with this. where you want to go with this is that there are tools and the mm-hmm. tools have been taken away from us. We can't have lead paint anymore because allegedly people like eating it and uh, we can't yeah. have copper wiring in, in our storm windows and, and, you know, in our in our screens, in our screen right, doors right. and our screens and all that. We can't have that because it's some sort of weird safety hazard or something. And we can't have asbestos tiles on our house anymore, even though, again, like all the rest of this, asbestos is only dangerous if it's airborne. Those tiles, especially the tiles that they actually perfected, are so hard. Even when they snap, they snap solid. So, you know, this that's all been part of a grand uh, con- really true conspiracy to get people to where they are now, which is exposed to all of this fuckery because the people in stone houses or in the people in old houses with this stuff still intact are in Faraday cages. They're in protected spaces and they're living cleaner lives and they may not even know it. Uh, but that that's part of it. So the silvered mirror is another thing to help us see silver yeah. is yeah. what the great reflector. And yeah. it is of course, part of the duality of the realm too. silver and gold. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's more here that needs to be said about how we parse through the terrain in front of us, because right now I don't know what we can trust, Randy. I, and I don't know if you're noticing this, but I'm noticing this. I'm noticing a lot of people that used to be in our circles that had platforms besides all the ones that are now dead. And there are many, I just found out more this week. I'm noticing a big shift in them, a big shift in narrative, a change in narrative that's like you talked this way for a decade and now you're pulling up to the system. Something's different. Mm -hmm, What's mm -hmm, different? mm -hmm. And so with the way that the algorithms are able to mimic us with the digital twinning, you know, they can knock people off and just replace them. We know this. So, again, uh, how do we know? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. These elements, we'll we'll stay with gold and silver. These are fundamentals of alchemy, of transformation, transmutation. They are part of the natural order. And our tools lie with nature. Our refuge is nature. Nature is not just earthbound. It's also uh, what is above us in, in the heavens. Those are part of our system as well. So the closer we are to the things of nature, um, silver, gold, you, you, you collect dolls. Those dolls generally are made of China, right? Oh, yeah, all my, all my dolls are 1800. So, yeah, China, okay. paper mache, right, wax, right. wood. So <clears throat> these are things that are crafted from the natural world. And... They weren't, they were 
aren't pressed by machines in, in some gigantic stamping plant in China or India. <clears throat> they were, they're, they're works of creation by people who loved. That's why I shared that one post on Twitter with you about the, the puppets. Yes. Because there is a love behind that. There's a lure behind it. And the things that we create with our hand, with our minds, and with the tools of nature are fundamentals. That's where we learn how to create beyond the fundamentals. So the elements are earth elements, and they're purification elements. There's, there's purification in things, like chalk. I love working with chalk. I like watercolors. I love chalk, too. Um, these are natural things that represent the world around us as opposed to the digital world, which is flat screen, which you know has gazillions of colors, all variations of the spectrum, uh, arrayed around you in, in, in dense pixels, but they're nothing. You know, you turn the screen off and they disappear. So they're not tangible. They don't exist beyond the digital realm, which is not a real realm. It's only real in terms of what we see in an image and our reality is constructed of images and the way we produce the way we produce our world is through the magic of imagination interactive with the creative materials around us so the closer we are to the real to nature the closer we are in affinity because all of these things have frequencies to creating something out of natural order that then expands into a greater creational process. We've, we've lost so much of this. I mean, you talked about the architecture and how that's changed. There's a reason for that. That knowledge was, that knowledge was lost and it became too expensive because of the way things were valued in this new system, which sacrificed human creative potential dignity for the harvesting of money energy, which is dirty energy. Whereas there are other ways we can construct our economic systems, which are more equitable, which are, you know, fair value trade for uh, value for value. What, here's what I do. What do you got? Somebody else over here has got this and it runs a whole spectrum. And if we ran, a, if we ran a creative system, an economic system unmitigated and just fair trade between us for what's the most beautiful thing you can make for the most valuable thing that you need, require, want, etc. Those are all amplifications of creative energy. And see, because of this system now, this harvesting system, which is parasitic, it's vampiric, it's archontic, it's demiurgic, We've lost connection with creation on that real level. That's why we don't have great painters like we had in the Renaissance. That's why we don't take solid blocks of marble anymore and create a David out of it like Michelangelo. That's why you can't get porcelain dolls anymore because the, the love of craftsmanship and creativity has been bled out of it by this parasitic system. If we look at... All this that we've been talking about, and we start to take a final look at the realm, kind of towards the end of this this conversation, and we think about how the old things and the old world, there was a real sense of what was a specter and what was real. And again, our houses were built differently differently. Even into the mid-century of last century, we were around grandma's antiques or someone's, you know, there's all this stuff that still had a connection to something that really was tied into the, the natural world. Now, I get that all extractions are still part of the natural world, but there's an extraction process. There's a process that takes things from one form to another. And so say if we're in this space now where we don't have protection from even cosmic rays, right? 
and then we get to the darker, sicker things with Li-Fi, light manipulation, sound manipulation, all of the types of radiation and millimeter waves and augmented reality, virtual reality in this space where very few people have real silvered mirrors. Very p- few people have safe spaces within their house because those elements that made them safe are illegal now. Specters can walk amongst us. We could be knee deep in them and think they're real because there's nothing to tell us that they're not there. And what I mean by that is they may very well be there interdimensionally, but they can't harm us. And so this is where the game of amping up the human being in their day-to-day life, that we're being manipulated chemically by things that can't actually harm us in this physical environment unless they are also in these forms that we're in. And of course, that is at play as well. But say back in 1920, and we're in these spaces we're talking about, Specters walked around, but you can't see that they're not in the room. You can't see them physically through through the silvered mirrors because the silvered mirror is showing you what's physically with you, what's real and true, true. And now, now, so we we encountered those kinds of apparitions, those specters in a metaphysical way, in a mediumistic way, and they had a certain flavor and flair, and I'm not suggesting they were real or not real, but I'm also saying that about now. Now we don't have the tools to discern what is real and what's not real. And since it's become even more insidious with the idea that everyone now realizes that the state of technology and science has brought us into this world of illusions, like it doesn't even need to be masquer- in a masquerade anymore. The tools are gone, so we don't know. So it could be that we think we're walking over a cliff And that gets our adrenaline going. And of course, all the parasites feed right off of that. And and this never-ending suffering and this never-ending worrying and this never-ending squeezing of the human being contents under pressure to continually feed off of it without it knowing or having tools to know that it's all illusionary On one sense, because if it knew that these things that do not exist in the realm with it, therefore we as the human beings have the upper hand in the realm and we could just ignore them. We could just shut off the floodgate of, of, of chemical extraction from our adrenos, from, from all of it, from our endocrine system, we would have the power. But what's happened, Randy, is we've now we're deeper into this. And that's what I'm talking about with this whole situation. The tools have been taken away. And if you look at the bigger arc going on, what are they doing in in a big part of this overlay in our lives. They've been tearing down the old structures forever. My whole life I've been trying to save them. They've been, uh, you know, different terrorist groups have blown up the old old stuff and, and constantly getting rid of the old stuff. The old is bad. The old is bad. And this all looks like a planned move to take us into the hellish scape that we are kind of in now. Right. Well, so there's on on one level, these these entities only have the ability to influence. They harvest energy off of us, but they operate extra dimensionally. So again, I come back to this: we have to look at who we are, and we have to look at our ability to control within our own reality construct, the flow of matter, time, uh, creation, destruction, because those are, you know, obviously two ends of the same process. There's a 
level of destruction that comes with the creation of something new. But all of these constructs exist whether they're destroyed here or not. So the tragedy is that we are losing the ability to desire the beautiful things. Our aesthetics have been changed as a result of this this onslaught of, you know, and I, you know, I'll go with postmodernism just as one example of how to institutionalize ugly. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we uh, we we still have it within us <clears throat> to create great beauty and to work with the natural forms. The instruction sets for the creation of everything aren't lost. They're there. They're in the collective memory pool. Those become birthed when intentionality meets the creative impulse again in humanity to move out of this um, synthetic aesthetic that we're in. It's like the rebirth of vinyl. You know, vinyl records never went away. It's my, because I just love vinyl records. Um, but watching the resurgence of vinyl records, watching a generation of people who didn't grow up with them marvel at them again, it's a concrete form. It's something you can touch in an era when music became a commodity that was basically worthless. I mean, we watched from the time Napster appeared what happened to music as an entire industry was plowed under by this. And now we're rediscovering the power again of um, tangible music and supporting, because there's no really record labels left except for those that want to sell you gangster rap and, you know, auto-tuned pop music. So real <laughs> musicians now exist in places where they basically have independently sourced out their music. And that's that to me is like kind of a model to look at and go, hey, you know, we can create, we can support each other, we can do beautiful things, we can have a format for creation, we can remember. Um, old recording technologies have come back, you know. People have gone out and bought old, you know, 16-track reel-to-reel decks and are recording music with it again. Why? Because it's old technology. You can touch it. You can feel it. It's flawed, but it's beautiful. That's what humanity is. We're part of an organic whole, and we're flawed, but we're beautiful, and our flaws are part of the expression of that beauty that then we create more and more on the canvas of our reality. Within that, there are flaws, and the flaws are beautiful, and you're beautiful because you're flawed, and you're flawed because you're beautiful. And that's something we have to, to consider, is that as human beings, we've been taught to hate everything about ourselves, when in fact it is the flawedness of us all that is the actual beauty because it's the most organic. Nature, nature doesn't have symmetry. Nature doesn't operate in squares and planes and angles. Nature is a flowing symmetrical system. Yes. Oh, I love it. And it winds right back to we are encountering ourselves Mm -hmm. ultimately and how beautiful or monstrous that experience is, is part of the process here and who was able to and who is able to navigate through this very difficult terrain to get to those plateaus of Mm -hmm. self-awareness, of self-awakening, of self-love, of self-acceptance. It's not a meme. It's not something anyone can give you. It's something that you have to be able to encounter yourself and see yourself as you are. That's the bottom line. And that I think is a very yeah. difficult thing to do. But ultimately, that's where we're headed. Yeah, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed individually and collectively. I wish I could say it's easy. It's not. It's not supposed to be. 
you know, that's kind of why I, I guess this whole eye of the needle thing just kind of became the metaphor because it sort of illustrates a process that that's, it involves a certain amount of violence to the fabric of what we operate on. And as we go through it, there's turbulence. And in that, there is all of the things that unwind all these energies, both dark and light, and kind of un- we unveil things. We're, we're peeling back layers of reality right now, and even if we don't know it. We're being forced to do it because in the unconscious right now, humanity has reached this place in history where as a collective, we've, we're confronting our own shadow. And that shadow wants to keep us ensnared in the artifice and we need to move through it back towards the natural constructs of things and deal with ourselves on a very organic level. I agree. And I can't believe we've done over two hours. <laughs> what in the hell? Top dilation. <laughs> now we're going to collapse time. <laughs> well, I, I hope it's not so long next time, but it happens when it happens. And you know I love you, baby. You're out yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> you too. It's always great to come back on and talk to you because... Whew, <laughs> we, did, we dig hard. We dig hard. We work. Yeah. We really Big do. Struggles. But we come out with so much more. And and with yeah. that, how do people find you? Where are you? What's going on with Where Randy I? Moggins? Uh, I got a new website coming. I actually just put it up. Offplanetradio.com is alive. There's nothing there yet, but the landing page is there. So the website is coming. There's um, uh, a lot of things in shift right now. But um, the energies are bending again, so I'm going to get back into it a bit more. So you, the information will be on OffPlanetRadio.com. For now, I'm on Patreon, Randy Moggins. And uh, you can always go to YouTube. There's um, 10 years worth of videos on YouTube. So uh, that's Off Planet Media on YouTube. So there you go. Excellent. And Randy, thank you again. This whole show thank is just going to be in the public. I want yes. I want everyone to reap the benefits of this. And cool. we shall talk soon. All right. This is Off Planet Radio. Thank you.